Randy K. here. We all go through struggles at times. And I want to share with you through stories and insights and interviews with others how much God loves you. He loves you immensely. And that's what I hope you will hear through our interviews and what we have to share with you. Thanks for staying tuned. Here we go. Hi, Randy Kay here with the Heaven Series. This is a very special episode for me because I have my friend John Burke with me today. Uh, John and I have a special story that I think we'll share as to how we met with his son uh, one lunchtime uh, in San Diego, California. John is the New York Times bestselling author of Imagine Heaven, which I consider to be the quintessential, that is the the most comprehensive book about near-death experiences and afterlife experiences. So his scope and depth and breadth of knowledge about this subject, I think um, is superior to to anyone, certainly that I'm aware of. And uh, he spent uh, about 30 years uh, researching the subject, began uh, his career as an engineer. So he's very practically minded. Uh, and uh, also was an agnostic, as I was. And so we're going to have a conversation about what was interesting, John, and welcome to, uh, to our show here. Thank, it's great, great to, to have be you. on with you. <laughs> yeah. we, were talk- we were talking about how you have interviewed so many people that have, have had near-death uh, experiences, but this is the first time that somebody who has had a near-death experience has interviewed you. That's right. Turn, <laughs> well, this turnabout's is very, fair play, right? <laughs> right, right. Well, it's it's going to be fascinating for me because you do have that expansive knowledge there. And tell us about, to start off with, about how you got involved in this subject of studying near-death experiences, because the church really had been somewhat silent to a large extent on the subject, the Christian church yeah. especially. Um, so how did that all or antagonistic out? actually yeah so I when I was an agnostic um, my dad was dying of cancer uh, and this is in 78 um, and the first research published on this uh, was done I think it was in 76 so th- it was brand new someone had given him the the book on it as he was dying just to help with the fear of death. And I saw it on his nightstand and I picked it up and just hmm, start reading it. And I couldn't stop. And I read the whole thing in one sitting. And it was hundreds of people who had clinically died, you know, like yourself, heart had stopped beating, brainwave ceased in some cases. And yet they came back telling of this amazing experience of the life to come. And for me, as an agnostic and an analytical engineer type mind, I was fascinated because I was like, oh my gosh, like this may actually be evidence that this stuff is true. Because I'd heard it all, but I always thought, who, you know, nobody can tell me why, you know, this isn't just myth, right? Jesus is probably a good you know, a good teacher, you know, get, gets mythologized, you know, legend like all the rest. God, maybe, but nobody can explain how you know. And here was something that gave me evidence. So I then, um, the next year, uh, someone, and I don't think it was coincidental, invited me into a small group Bible study to just explore faith in Jesus. And I think I was open because of reading of so many accounts of these people experiencing Jesus, you know, and, or this God of light and love. And so I then, uh, after about eight months in that, asking a lot of questions, I came to faith in Christ, Um, later went from a career in engineering uh, into full-time ministry. And, uh, and eventually started a church for skeptics like me. We've reached a lot of skeptical uh, high-tech engineers and you know, all, kinds of, all kinds of people from all different religious backgrounds. And during that time, like you said, over about 30 years, I was just so curious, like how do these near-death experiences fit together? And then how do they fit with what God has revealed through the Bible? 
And that, that's been my interest all along. And that's what I wrote Imagine Heaven to show that what I discovered is an amazing overlap and correlation between the commonalities of what people say. Every, every experience is a little different, it's unique, but the commonalities, I, I mean, it's, it's amazing how it aligns to show the, the, the picture of the life to come, you know, the, that God's been revealing all along in the scriptures. Mm. You know, your expertise and based on, on your studies of these various uh, accounts kind of um, relates to a topic that is very, I would say, important or uh, of interest to our viewers, which is the accounts they've heard from some others testify of a very ethereal realm of um, maybe angels, maybe, you know, it's more mystic uh, account of their near-death experience, whereas others testified meeting Jesus, mm -hmm. of meeting God in heaven. Uh, what do, how do you contrast those two? And the question that many have is, why? Why do some have one account in heaven with Jesus and others have these, these more mystical accounts from their experience? Yeah, and let me say, I, I mean, I've, I've studied or interviewed, talked to over a thousand people who have had these near-death experiences over the course of 30 years. And, um, and honestly, you know, uh, that's why it took me so long to write Imagine Heaven, because there were missing pieces to the puzzle of how does this all align? And some of that was my question along the way is like, some people, it, it aligns with what the Bible is saying. And then others, it's like, eh, eh, I don't get it. And, um, and what I found, and I think this is really important to understand, in the early 80s, when this, when this research was just coming out, unfortunately, what happened is many um, pastors or people in the church they hear people talk about, I left my body and I was there in the room, like, you know, a ghost. And they don't, they don't have the category, um, the biblical category even. And I, and I show that in Imagine Heaven. It's all there in the Bible. But if you haven't really systematically studied it, you, you don't necessarily see that, oh, yeah, Paul had one of these near-death experiences, more than likely. Acts 14 talks about it. 2 Corinthians 12, he talks about when he was stoned to death in Lystra, probably. Uh, he said, I, whether in my body or out of my body, I don't know, but I was taken up into heaven and saw and heard things inexpressible. Well, I think that is a near-death experience. He was stoned to death and left for dead, and then he gets back up after they circle him and pray for him, right? And he's saying, this happened to me. And then Paul talks about how when we die, we have a spiritual body. Our, our physical body is sown in weakness, but it's raised in dunamis, in power. And so early on in the 80s, people were coming out talking about their near-death experience and how they have like not just five senses, but like 50 senses. And they're like Superman, you know, and, and telescopic vision and colors beyond anything you've ever Seen, and, and I think a lot of Christians and, and clergy, too, didn't have category to place it in, weren't comfortable enough with the mystery of it to explore and try to, try to ask questions and make sense of it. So they just pushed it away. They just said, oh, that, that doesn't sound right. Stay away from that. That's satanic. Or that's just, you know, too new agey for us, you know. And so they would just push it away. Consequently, what happened is those who had had these experiences felt rejected by the church, the very place where they ought to be able to process it and, and integrate and make sense of it from the scriptures. And instead, there was a group of researchers that kind of said, come over here. And there, there was a whole pool of people formed that most of the early research was done out of this pool of people who had had near-death experiences that mostly had been rejected by the church and started to form their own kind of worldview around it. And, and so it took people like yourself, Christians who would be bold enough to say, this is what happened to me. 
and, and face some of the push away and rejection of the church or the business community or people thinking they were crazy. And enough had to do that where I could then see, oh, okay, here are the rest of the pieces of this puzzle um, to put it all together. Mm. You know, I, I've got to say, John, and I think I may have shared this with you previously, that I read Imagine Heaven before, before I shared my account publicly. Uh, and really the first person that I didn't know, I wasn't close to only a handful of persons, uh, including my wife and pastor knew about this. The first person that was a stranger to me at the time was you. And at that lunch, that you with shared it with? I mean, we didn't know each other at the time. Yeah. And I had read uh, years prior, Imagine Heaven. And I was reading, um, I, I was reading the accounts and I felt like I wasn't alone anymore. Mm -hmm. I felt like I was the only one, an island of, of one. And I also felt that you had given license for us who had had these experiences to share. Um, mine came out inconsequentially. I was being interviewed about a business book that I'd written and the, the former pastor of mine had asked me about, he knew about my uh, near-death experience. That was How the you? first time I got you know, went public and that was accidentally because he said I'm, he shared um, on air about it. Mm. And, uh, but, but that is something I think that, you know, maybe is missed is that the vast majority of those who have had near-death experiences uh, are not comfortable with sharing them publicly because of the potential ridicule. But statistically, I mean, how many of us are there uh, in the in the world? Today? Well, there was there was just a study done by the um, European Academy of Neuroscience studying across thirty five countries, and they found one in ten pe people have had a near death experience. One in 10. Now the Gallup poll had found, uh, did a uh, you know, national survey back in the, um, I think early nineties and found one out of 25 Americans. And so, yes, they're very common. And one of the points I make in Imagine Heaven is that I, I tried to find and put the stories of, you know, medical doctors, bank presidents, CEOs, um, college, tenured college professors, you know, people who had zero to gain, you know, because sometimes people, oh, they're just writing books and making money. First of all, if you've ever written books, <laughs> you realize you don't make money. <laughs> I testify. Yes. I've so actually lost money. I, you it, know. Yeah, it's definitely not <laughs> that, that effect. But these are people like yourself. And I remember when, you know, you were wrestling with me about when I write this book, if I put this out there, my career might be over, you know? And these are people all like that. Like they have no motive whatsoever to make up crazy wild stories of dying and seeing God. But they can't say otherwise because like, you know, you've told me too, it is the most real thing you've ever, more real than this reality. And, you know, Randy, back to your question that I didn't, I didn't answer about the, the variety of experiences and some having, you know, just kind of these ethereal, um, you know, just kind of misty experience or whatever. Here's what I've realized is that the, our world, Earth, is vast, right? And if you had 100 people plop into different places from outer space on Earth and then go back and all tell what's Earth like? Well, if you, if you landed in the subway in New York City, you would say it's a crowded, dark tunnel, right? If you, if you landed in Central Park in New York City, you'd say it's, it's this beautiful garden-like you know, place. If you landed in the desert of Arizona, you'd say it's pretty bare. If you landed in the mountains of Colorado, you know, and, and you'd experience different people and different cultures. It's different. It's vast. And that's what I would have to say is, God's world beyond our world, we are actually the finite limited part of the universe that God has created, right? So we are, we are forced into three dimensions of space, one dimension of time. 
But as you know, from being on the other side, there are many dimensions of space beyond this, and there are more dimensions of time, right? And, you know, the Bible says that in 2 Peter 3, 8, to the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. And you guys are just validating what, what it's saying. And so, consequently, when someone dies, you know, and I, I have not been able to correlate any kind of like, um, if they're dead this long or dead from this or that, they have this depth of experience, I, I can't find any correlation. And I've tried. So I don't know the why. But if you think about all the different kind of aspects of a near-death experience, from leaving your body, observing the room around you, realizing you have a spiritual body, you feel more, your, more alive, more yourself, more... Uh, more senses to life experience, um, a new experience of kind of time and space and all that. Well, that's kind of just like the first level. And pretty much everybody who dies and leaves their body experiences that. Now, you could conclude, and this, this, this is part of what took me a long time to try to put all the pieces together with how it fits with the Bible. You could conclude that well, because this person left their body and was, was there in heaven, I guess, and felt great and peaceful and more alive than ever and all the, well, then the conclusion that some made is, well, look, everybody goes to heaven. But what you begin to find is as, as you go into the depth of these experiences, is there is there is a traveling um you know some say through a tunnel some it's you know it's it's more like a path of light or um you know there are various ways that they travel there's experiencing new realms of of, of beauty is it paradise is it a taste of heaven but others also i mean 23 percent according to uh an international association of near-death experience survey um, which is, this is not a Christian organization, but 23% of those reporting experiences talk about hellish experiences. So that, that's got to be integrated in as well, right? But what I realized is that just because someone begins in one kind of environment and experience, that doesn't tell you where it's going from there. So, for instance, um, you know, you, you know uh, Howard Storm, right? You met him. Yes. Uh, yeah. Former tenured college professor, atheist, um, you know, by his own admission, did not live a good life. I mean, he was living for himself. And he dies. And the first thing he experienced, he didn't think he would experience anything. He thought it'd be lights out. But he's there in the room. And he said, I felt like Superman incredible peace. I've, I had all these super senses. And then he has a welcoming committee, which is another commonality, right? That, that the, the loved ones or the friends who have died before come and greet them and, and usher them into heaven, um, or at least welcome them, tell them they have to go back, what, whatever it might be. Well, Howard also had a welcoming committee. And at first, they're incredibly nice, and, and he thinks they're there for his surgery. And he, so he's in, even confused that he's dead. But as the story unfolds, and I write about this in Imagine Heaven, you know, they turn out to deceive him. And what he realizes is that they were his kindred spirits on earth, meaning kind of like attracts like in the sense that these were people who had rejected God, lived for self, and now in the life to come, it was pretty much dominate or be dominated. And that's what they lived for. And he discovered that they were taking him on a journey away from God into more and more hellish experiences. That was their intention. So my point is, there's deception in this world, and there's deception on the other side as well. So we have to take that into account. On the other hand, People like Dr. Mary Neal and, and many others I interviewed who talk about this welcoming committee 
of friends and relatives who had died before and just exuding this incredible love and communication telepathically or you know thought to thought heart to heart more than just words well they knew intuitively this group was there to welcome me and greet me and guide me and protect me and i would ask them protect protect you from what and say i don't know i just had this intuitive knowledge that they were there to guide me on my journey to heaven and protect me hmm. so i think you know when you like like i said when you look at thousands of these and all across the globe you start to see one or the other alone does not give you the full the full vastness of the life to come and even thousands of them by themselves apart from i think the revelation god's given in scripture don't give you a full picture and so people the, the way i like to talk about it is this is truly an other world experience and so people are going to interpret it according to their own worldview that's just what they're going to do so not every interpretation of their experience aligns with what God's revealed in, in scripture. But when you look at the commonality of the picture they're given, it absolutely does. You know, you um, have explained it, I think at one point as this way, uh, in addition to what you've just said, and that is that everyone who's had a near-death experience and has come back to tell about it, they're alive. So the, the chapter has not been closed. Their life has not ended. Uh, it, may have, it may have ended clinically for a period of time, but they returned. And, right. and so Howard Storm, who I have interviewed as well um, with two Christian dudes, and mm -hmm. we've interviewed on that program, uh, actually not I didn't have the opportunity to interview you, but, you know, I was kind of part of a, a dialogue with you with uh, Sean Tabbitt mm -hmm. that Howard Storm explained a very similar account to another guest we had on that I had interviewed, uh, Brian uh, Melvin, who had an experience in hell mm -hmm. and had uh, you talked about being greeted by a number of people who were uh, giving him this kind of this appearance or this vision of something which was a paradise in fact for brian they they said to brian welcome to paradise and there was this house kind of a farmhouse and a very idyllic environment and brian went toward that and then it was exposed in this very hellish account that behind the veneer mm. of this so-called paradise there was hell mm -hmm. and uh so that's that's interesting because you talk about the different dimensions and I can empathize with that because one of my struggles is that when people ask me about my account and they want to know, you know, what does it look like? How does it, you know, in the context of time, space and all of these things, I'm like, well, there's, there's nothing in the, in the lexicon of all of the languages around the world that really explains this. I mean, science hasn't discovered Physics has not revealed the fullness of what heaven is like. It's not, and and there's, you know, when the when there's the new heaven and the new earth, and I wanted to ask you about this, uh, the new heaven and new earth, that's one thing that's been a conundrum to me when God established in the Bible that there would be a new heaven and a new earth, and people have asked me, and I'm sure they've asked you as well, well, what about that? What happens to the people who are in heaven now and um, subsequent to this new earth, the, the millennium, you know, the thousand year period and so forth. So uh, share, if you will, about that, uh, that revelation uh, in the, by the book of Revelation and Daniel and other accounts of that happening in the future. How does that marry up to those who are in heaven currently? Let me, let me talk about that by giving first an analogy that I think for those of us, me included, who have not had near-death experiences, but the struggle that you guys have trying to express it. So imagine if the world we're living in right here, this three-dimensional experience, 
is actually being lived on a flat black and white painting on the wall in your house, okay? And death means separation. So when we die, our spirit leaves or separates from our body. And then the body is no longer alive, right? So imagine at death, then your two-dimensional image, because remember on a flat two-dimensional picture, you can only move side, you know, up and down and side to side. There is no in or out. Can't even conceive of it. So here's this world all around you, but you don't even know what around means, right? You don't have that. So no, no vocabulary. Now you die, meaning you are ripped off your two-dimensional plane and you're brought out in a, in a new dimension into three dimensions of space and you see color. And that was only black and white back there. And you have a, this whole new experience in new dimensions, and then you're pressed back into the two-dimensional flat black and white, and you are asked to describe three dimensions of color in two-dimensional black and white terms. How would you do it? And that is that I've concluded after interviewing so many of you guys is what you're trying to do. And, and it's also why they say things like, no, it was more real than this. This is the shadow. That's the real thing. Because imagine if, if we are actually spiritual beings created to live in the spiritual realm with God, okay, then what we're experiencing now is a limited, a constrained experience of life. And I think this actually makes a lot of sense philosophically, because it tells us in the book of Genesis that we are living in the knowledge of good and evil. Okay, that's where we live. Right, so God created free will creatures before human beings called angels. And we know they were free will because some of the angels said, I wanna, I, want, I wanna be God, I want my will and my way. Well, in eternal time, I guess, I mean, I, you know probably more than I do what, what I'm trying to talk about, but in, in eternal time, things I believe are eternal lies meaning that decision was an eternal decision. So if you decide, I don't want God ruling, where do you go where God is not ruling? And God chose to create a place to give the fallen angels what they thought they wanted. And the place is the place he will not, he chooses to not rule. And he lets the creature rule over itself. And that's hell. And so, and, and so we, so I think God in his love and mercy created earth and in a finite time bound, you know, we don't experience eternal time. We only experience time in one dimension, moving forward in one dimension, right? And in that though, is the opportunity for change and the opportunity for what would be called repentance of looking back and going, I, I want to turn, I want to turn God's way. So I think what God is doing is he's showing not only us, but he's showing the innocent angels as well in a time bound space, why seeking and following God and his loving will is really what is, is best for us. And so it's a, it's a time of choosing. Will we choose God or we, will we choose our own will and ways? And, and in that, that's why God in his love sent Jesus to pay for our sins so that all it takes is a choice, just a simple yes to God. I want your forgiveness. I want your leadership. And, and Jesus paid the price. So that is, that's all it takes. Mm. So I think what's happening is, you know, we are experiencing this, this finite realm that is really just a shadow of, of the life to come. And even you see this in, in the book of Hebrews, where God tells Moses to build the tabernacle, the place of meeting where, where God would meet with Israel, right? But he said it was constructed as a shadow of the real thing that's in heaven. And so I, I think that's, I think that's part of what's going on. 
Oh, you know, when, when you speak, it's like, well, he gets it, you know, <laughs> you know, that's that you really have uh, pinpointed, I think, the both the conundrum and trying to explain the experience and also the elucidation of what it means to enter into a space that is apart from anything akin to this world. Uh, and that helps explain why I and you know, a number of others, of course, that you've uh, interviewed or uh, that we feel like foreigners in this world. I felt, I never felt that way quite, quite like this. You know, I truly feel as a, uh, as a foreigner. In fact, I was uh, having trouble sleeping last night. I just woke up and I uh, turned to Renee, my wife, and, and I said, you know, Renee, I just, I, I, I this, I, I just, I, I don't like this place. <laughs> I don't like, you know, I don't like this place. And well, I you, teared up. <laughs> I was yeah. recording uh, something, a message uh, the other day. And I teared up and I, and I said, I just miss it. I miss it. Because that's I mean, where we belong. It's where we, we weren't created for earth. Earth is a, is a temporary, temporal time capsule to, to discover and find the God who hides himself so that we can learn by our own free will why his will is better. But, you know, people, people say to me, well, why didn't God just give everyone that experience, you know, like a near-death experience? And I remind them that almost everyone that I've interviewed, I, I, I haven't noticed on you, but almost everyone I've interviewed has a scar right here. They've all had tracheotomies. They died. <laughs> it was not fun coming back physically, medically. I mean, many of you guys, I mean, the recovery, God didn't spare you the sufferings of recovery coming back to a body that had broken down com completely right but yeah. what what i've commonly heard from you guys is the harder part is now realizing this is not where i belong and having experienced a love that all, all you know i've heard you all say it and you say it many different ways but it's Take all the love you've ever thought of having in this life from grandmother and mother and lover and husband or wife to kids, put it all in one point in time and multiply it by a thousand. And that's the ongoing love of God that you just don't ever want to leave. Imagine, imagine someone seeing so deep into your soul that you realize you are known intimately better than you even know yourself and this person is crazy about you like no one's ever been that crazy about you and 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 they just say why would i go back no one's ever loved me like this mm -hmm. and these are people who have children that they adore mothers that love their children I, I i know there was a woman in our church who when i did a series on this and and dr mary neal said the same thing you know when she came back, you know, she was depressed and her husband was devastated. He was like, we prayed and prayed that you would be saved. It was miraculous. You were supposed to die. Why are you depressed? And he took it personally. And the kids did too. Like, you don't love us. You don't want to be with us. And, and when Imagine Heaven came out, it actually helped heal because Darren then was able to read and realize, oh, it, it's not about me or the kids. It's that what God has in store for all of us is so exponentially better than any of this, that there's just a longing in the soul that, that can't be explained. Yeah. And I, and I, you know, when I say to people, it's in some ways, I, you know, I'll be honest. I mean, there've been days when I've been like, God, you know, why do you, you, you know, you've, I think created me to use my analytical mind to research this and all, but I don't get any experiences like this, you know, <laughs> it just, it just sometimes feels hollow and dry for me, you know, and I want, why can't I have that? And then he reminds me, you know, like it's a burden. It's a responsibility. It's, it's, you know, to, to taste 
what we were created for and then have to come back and be separated for a longer time, you know, is, is a responsibility. It is. I, I also suffered from depression after I returned for a period of time. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm appreciate your mentioning that, you know, I have, I was intubated by the way, John. So I, a tracheotomy for an accident victim is something that's done sometimes routinely, but for me, it was a slow, not, well, no, it wasn't a slow death, actually, um, the intubation. And so, yeah. but I still suffer. Oh, yeah. I still suffer from, I have damaged lungs, damaged heart. You know, as I mentioned, I had pneumonia recently. I've had that uh, now a total of about 14 times. And uh, so there's a residual effect physically, but that's almost inconsequential to the spiritual impact that it's had as a foreigner in this, in this world. And you have said, hmm? well, I was just going to say, if I can say something to your listeners too, because in a, in a bizarre way, this is very encouraging for the rest of us is that just because you've had one of these experiences, it, it doesn't mean God loves you more than the rest of us. And it doesn't mean you get a pass on the difficulties and the sufferings and even the confusing times of walking with God, right? I mean, what I love, you know, the, the reason I, I asked Randy if he would meet with me and my son in San Diego that day is I wanted my son to hear what Jesus told Randy about finding our purpose. Because, you know, every 20-something you know, we're trying to find, well, and 50 something, <laughs> we're all still trying to make sure we're doing what we're it's supposed never to. ending. Yeah. It's never ending, you know, to try to find our identity and find our purpose. And, you know, I, I, I love what Jesus said to you because, you know, it was what he said in, in John chapter 15, abide in me, stay connected to me moment by moment, and you will live your purpose. You will bear fruit. Apart from me, you're not going to do it. Yeah. Nothing. You, you accomplish nothing. And, and I think he meant, you know, because obviously we can build towers, we can build businesses, we can become famous and rich and drive big cars and houses and all that. <laughs> but nothing that actually lasts you know, and we can't accomplish the purpose for which we've been put here apart from walking in a moment by moment daily way with him. And that's what he said to you. I'm not going to tell you your purpose. You'd get out ahead of me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, it was a conundrum also, you know, for a type A, type A individual who had always uh, striven to uh, rise the corporate ladder and, uh, you know, founding a biotech company and so forth and being involved um, in that endeavor. Uh, academically and and so forth to now Jesus saying and that's the story of the butterfly we don't need to get into but uh, that moment by moment he was going to reveal his purpose to me uh, that that was uh, probably the worst thing that you can say to a type a you know yeah. <laughs> we want blueprints and he was stilling he, he was stilling me in the moment of my life uh, going forward you had, well, and, you had and let me ask you I mean did you come back and it's been easy to walk with God's spirit and abide in Christ? You know, it's interesting, John, because uh, what I noticed is that I would be more intentional in my living. So for example, when I would, um, let's say I was traveling and I was going to a car rental place and I, and I was realizing the Lord was revealing uh, either a word uh, of uh, knowledge or understanding about the person behind the counter or something for which I should pray for that person. Mm -hmm. And I was really this, realizing that this was going on. So each person, in some cases, there was one instance where um, a woman had, um, you know, been uh, at the hotel there and she looked kind of had a, a dour expression on her that is saddened expression a little bit, uh, but I wouldn't otherwise have picked up on, you know, I would have just, you know, thought, you know, that I, I would have thought nothing about it. And so I was talking to her about, you know, at the front desk checking in, um, you know, I know, instead of saying, how's your day, I said, you know, 
uh, are you having a tough day today? And that just opened up the door. Mm-hmm. And I was realizing these, these moments were then these periods of time throughout the day. And it, and it translated to the board meeting as well. When I was in the board meeting, I was, I was discerning in some cases, you know, board, board members, what the real agenda was in a way that I, I never had experienced previously. So I was making decisions, actually, um, what I would consider more from a, a heavenly perspective, if you will, uh, than I'd ever uh, before. You know, I yeah. was what's right for uh, what, what's right morally speaking and what we have to do with it. Whereas prior to this experience, it was very financially driven. Mm-hmm. And how do we survive? How do we how do we progress and acquisitions and things of that nature? Anyway, um, well, you I, had, I, think, mm-hmm. I think it's important just that um, those of us who haven't had an experience like this have the same spirit of God dwelling in us if we've opened our hearts to to his forgiveness and leadership in Christ. And what I've had to learn, but a, but a similar way is that, you know, I always wanted God to speak to me, like with an audible voice. But what I realized is that's very limiting. Like right now, I'm trying to get all my thoughts into your listeners' heads, right? But I have to use words and I have to, you know, I I don't say all the right things to get all the thoughts in the right way. And then you might not hear it or you might be thinking of something else. It'd be more direct if I could just put my thoughts directly in your mind. God can do that. Yeah. And that's how he just like that, you know, and I and I've I've seen many instances of that as well as you know, Jesus many times said, whoever has ears to hear, let him hear what the spirit says. Well, what does that mean? We all have these, right? Hmm. Well, no, there's a spiritual kind of hearing. It's tuning our spirit to understanding those thoughts, those promptings that come to our mind that are actually from God. And when we act on them by faith, then we get to see, you know, things like that. Like, okay, God really was prompting me here. Yeah. You know, that you say something interesting. I'm struggling here a bit myself. I just, I just overcame pneumonia recently. So, oh, no. and then we had our audience praying for me and uh, they were so kind about it and generous in their, in their uh, caring attitudes. What you're saying, I think, is so quintessential to the the Christian walk, because, um, yes, people say, well, I wish I had an experience like yours, but there's a price to be paid for that. You know, you have to die, right? Or, Or, you know, some people have, and that's one thing I was going to ask you about, is that you have interviewed a number of uh, people, uh, those of us who have clinically died, that is the heart stop, subsequently the brain stops. And then there are those who um, didn't quite get there. You know, they had what they call uh, a vision, or maybe they they believe they were transported to heaven. So maybe you can help us understand what that difference is between the two, or is there a difference between those experiences? Yeah, I've had, um, I, I can't say that I have researched the, the kind of heavenly visions side of it, but I've had a lot come to me um, since publishing Imagine Heaven of people who would say, I didn't die, but when I was reading Imagine Heaven, this is the same place I experienced. This is the same, you know, God who came to me in a vision or, or something like that. So I don't know. I, I mean, I'll tell you, Randy, um, I take every single one with a question mark. And I know that may sound funny and very cynical or skeptical, but I, I think there's something healthy to that. Like every, every experience you have to remember is a person interpreting an experience and so i don't i don't push them away i'm willing to hear it and consider it and wrestle with it but always wrestle with it through the lens of what has god revealed in in jesus and through the old testament prophets and and i have a whole reason i mean that's 
really why I came to faith as an engineer was not, uh, was not near-death experiences. That just opened me up. It was actually the historical proofs that God has given um, when he foretold what he was going to do so that we could know that he was going to do it in Jesus. And, you know, I'm, I won't go into all that, but I think that does remind us that, you know, God has given us his revelation in Christ ultimately, but in the scripture so that we can discern, you know, truth from, from deception. And so I, I, I say that in that with these heavenly experiences too, I mean, there have been, there've been a lot of them that do seem to align. And, um, and, and so, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna just poo poo them, but at the same time, I'm trying to take all of it and say, okay, well, how does that fit with what God said in scripture? And then with each of them, what do you want me to do with that, Lord? And sometimes it's nothing, and sometimes it's, oh, pay attention to this or, or that. Yeah, it's, you know, it's, I'm glad that you, you do discern and you have a vetting process for these, um, because you do look from a, as a, from a third party objective point of view. My point of view, as I listen to some of these stories or I, I speak to individuals, um, and we have so many that now have come to me, uh, you know, I had an NDE or, or someone and so forth. Um, and there's some accounts that um, I have to be frank with you, John, uh, they, they've irritated me. <laughs> it's like, I, I had, there was one account of somebody who said, you know, I went to heaven, didn't, didn't die uh, clinically, but I went to heaven. It was kind of like a, a vision, I guess. And I saw, you know, roller coasters. I saw all, all kinds, you know, and I'm thinking, oh my goodness, this is, this doesn't resonate with my soul or my experience whatsoever. But I'll talk to others that you have interviewed for your book and, and during the course of time during your studies, and there will be a kinship. There's an absolute kinship that mm -hmm. I will have with them. There's just a koinonia relationship. And I have that with you by virtue of almost vicariously through these experiences um, that you've accounted for in, in your writings and your speakings uh, that, that really is a kinship. I mean, there's almost, I won't call it a club, but there's something there that it's like, oh, you get me, you know, mm. it's, it's that. And you had, I, um, I wanted to get to something that I think is very important today. And that is, We've talked about the fact that so many people are fascinated by these stories. They want to hear. This is a time, and I don't know if it's because of COVID or whatever is going on within the world, where people are just gravitating toward this subject. Yeah, I've noticed that. And, uh, and the question that that begs is God doing something in this season where these accounts are, are doing something in the spiritual realm as well as in the, um, you know, the actual physical. Your, your thoughts on that from a macro level? I mean, I absolutely think that these are gifts from God. And I think in our, you know, interconnected global YouTube world, um, for the first time, I mean, we can see, and, and this is part of the, what I find so amazing. People have the same core experience all around the globe. And I've chronicled, you know, and I, and I show them in Imagine Heaven, even like a, a study of 500 Indians in the continent of India and 500 Americans, two totally different, you know, uh, cultural religious upbringings, but they're experiencing the same, you know, the, the, the same um, God, and they're not experiencing the things that they would expect, the Vedic loci, um, reincarnation, dissolution of the self into the supreme Brahman force. Um, they're not experiencing that. They're experiencing a white-robed man in a beard 
shining brighter than the sun with a book of accounts. <laughs> That's the Bible, you know, or, you know, um, and, and, you know, I, I think this is another thing that has tripped many Christians up. It's like, well, why would they experience God if they, the God of Jesus, if they don't believe in him? Well, several things you have to remember. First, um, God created all of us to know him, right? And God revealed himself to Saul on the Damascus road as a brilliant blinding light that he knew was God, but he didn't believe in Jesus. He was persecuting Christians, right? And, and at the same time in Revelation 1-7, Jesus said, every eye will see me, even those who pierce me, everyone will look on him. And so just because someone has an experience uh, of, of God, and in fact, in Imagine Heaven, I chronicle some where, you know, Jesus, uh, Jesus is there with them. I mean, have you, have you interviewed Heidi? I have, yes. Okay, so, so your listeners may remember Heidi. So Heidi, Heidi reached out to me when I was on um, Megan Kelly. She saw me on the news, emailed me and said, I don't know who you are. I've never read your book, but that happened to me. When I was 16, my horse fell on me and crushed me. I was raised in a Jewish agnostic family, but Jesus was there with me. I've never told anyone that. Thanks. <laughs> That's all she said. <laughs> so I reached out to her and we, we ended up getting a friendship and I was able to explain to her how Jesus is the Jewish Messiah and all through Isaiah and all the, the prophets and you know, and she ended up getting baptized. I mean, she had always believed in Jesus because she met him. But, you know, what's interesting is she believed in God. And in her life review, Jesus showed her that he was the God there sitting by the bedside when she would pray to him. And so there, there, weren't, there weren't two. There's only one God, right? Um, and so I think even in these experiences around the world, God is giving a new apologetic, um, a new uh, evidence of, of his love and of his existence and how he's calling all nations to himself, you know? And, and I think, you know, and that's what I felt called to do is help people around the world and all nations see that this God did what he did through Jesus so that all could turn to him. You know, you can get off the wheel of samsara and this, this craziness of trying to pay for every bad deed of bad karma, or you're coming back again and again and again. He frees you. You don't have to worry about that anymore. You know, I mean, that's, 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 that's depressing to me. Well, it is. That would be I mean, depressing to me oh, to have yeah. to go and through it, this several times. Yeah. And, and Jesus came to free us from all the fears of judgment and punishment and payment for our sins, right? Whatever, however your religious background or culture has interpreted that. What's fascinating is I've studied the world's religions is all the, all the world's religions in their sacred texts agree on this. They agree on the basic moral law. And by the way, C.S. Lewis chronicled this in his book, Abolition of, of Man. We all agree on basic moral principles of right and wrong. We all have in every culture for all time. But what does that tell us? Because we've all broken our own moral laws. We haven't all kept them. We've all broken them, right? And, and, and so the question is, well, what does God do with that? And I think what God is showing us all around the globe is that God, God is a God of compassion and love. And even as people experience their life review, which life reviews in the presence of this God who is light and love and life brighter than the sun. What was Jesus on the transfiguration? His face shone brighter than the sun, right? In John chapter, uh, Revelation chapter one, you know, this, this is the resurrected Jesus. And, you know, and, and many are coming back from these near-death experiences and they're seeking him and they're finding him. But not everybody does. And that's very confusing because some, you know, Heidi was a Jewish woman who experienced Jesus. Well, there was another Jewish woman I write about in Imagine Heaven who dies in a car accident. Her two kids are in the car. She's standing there, you know, in her spiritual body now watching. 
and sees this bright light over her right shoulder and turns just like Heidi and there's Jesus and she knows it's Jesus. And she said, he took my hand and I've never felt such a wonderful feeling in my whole life. I've never felt so loved. And I had this feeling like I could just stay with you here forever. But he then takes her and he shows her a hellish experience. And then he shows her a vision of her kids, three of them. She only had two older calling to her mommy, come back. We need you. Mm -hmm. And she said, I wanted to stay there with this Jesus, but I also knew he didn't want me to stay because if I did, I would be one of those miserable people. Mm -hmm. So she goes back, but her conclusion is, I don't know what to make of that because I'm Jewish. I don't believe in Jesus. Mm. It's like, what? <laughs> <laughs> but this is a very, very important. Now, you know, I mean, hopefully in time she will overcome whatever that pride is that would hold her heart, you know, captive. But God doesn't take away our free will just because we have these experiences. And people can come back, and I've seen it. Some people come back. And even though they've experienced this God who loves us and oversees what we're doing, they don't seek God. They seek to recreate the experience, you know, trying to have out-of-body experiences and transcendental meditation or ayahuasca or all these things that God very clearly in the scripture says, don't go there. Don't do that. When you cross over, yeah, you may be really crossing over to the other side, but you're going unprotected. And there is evil and there is deception. So that's why I think the, the Bible has to be our framework of, through which to look at and interpret these. Otherwise, I think people can get themselves in all kinds of other deception. Oh, I'm so glad you, you said that. Um, you know, we interviewed uh, Rabbi Felix Halpern, who clinically died and um, he came to know Jesus, Yeshua, as his uh, Messiah. Mm. And uh, you will be, uh, for our audience, uh, John will be our uh, keynote speaker in opening the Afterlife 2022 conference. You can go to randyk.org for more information about that. Uh, and that will be broadcast uh, internationally, but it's going to also be, it's a virtual conference, and we will be broadcast into Israel. And uh, we have a love for the uh, Jewish people in uh, Israel because uh, we know um, a number of uh, both Jewish believers and Jewish non-believers and, and Jesus is the Messiah. Yeah. And, um, you know, we're commissioned to, uh, to show the love of, of Christ uh, to the nations. And uh, so Absolutely. we've had people, John, that have, have written to us or not written as they, that's a, that's an old term emailed or, you know, mm -hmm. uh, communicated in some fashion with us and said, you know, I came from, um, you know, from India, China and other parts of the world. And they're saying, you know, I, this is not my, it was not my religion, but I experienced this Jesus you're talking about. And he became real to me and I'm a believer now in Jesus. Yeah, and they don't I've use heard... the, the Christian terminology necessarily. No. They're talking about Jesus and that something changed in me. And, you know, I now, you know, I, I know this, this person, I know him and I know he's God. I met God. Right. And, but and not I've, in the vernacular. Of, I've had uh, people say the same thing. Tell me the same story from Tehran in Farsi, in the Farsi language in, <laughs> in Brazil um, you know, in, in other places in the Middle East, you know, in Mauritius, you know, in Polynesia, I mean, all, all over the globe. And so I do think, Randy, this is a gift from God that he's giving in our global village to show us there is only one God of all humanity. And what he did when he chose Abraham and Sarah, remember, uh, you know, the, the founders of the Jewish nation, is he said, you know, I'm going to bless you. Why? Genesis 12, to be a blessing to all the nations. 
and search the scriptures of, of the world's religions. There's only one God who has been speaking to and for all nations. 500 times in the Bible, God addresses all the nations. He's the God of all people. And he doesn't, he doesn't play favorites. He doesn't love some of his children more than others. And he created all of us you know, to, to be his children. That is our intent. And it's not his will that any should perish. And that's why he went to such extremes on the cross, right? To enter our suffering, to deliver us mm. through it. Yeah, I don't know any other uh, God, God, small G or uh, capital G that would hang on a cross for those who spat on him and tortured him. So that's unique to Jesus. Um, John, as, as I mentioned, uh, you will be uh, speaking at our Afterlife 2022 conference. Uh, you wrote the book Imagine Heaven, which remains after you wrote, I think you published that in 2015, was it? Mm -hmm. And it remains uh, a best uh, top of the charts. Uh, I encourage you to read that book. It is uh, so phenomenal and other and look up, uh, we'll note in the uh, comment section, the other books that John has written as well, uh, that I strongly encourage you to read all of his books, because I was blessed in, in reading, uh, I think, all of the books you've writ written, at least all of them on Amazon. Wow, or, I don't think I've you know, Christian that. book, <laughs> christianbook.com, <laughs> you know, I, I think I've, I, and I think I got your signature for at least a couple of them. Uh, well, um, thank you. So uh, that's going to be a great blessing. You're a uh, senior pastor of Gateway Church uh, in Austin, uh, Texas. So look up uh, Gateway in Austin, Texas for John's messages as well. And uh, we'll keep you informed at randyk.org of other um, events and John's activities. If he shares those with us, we'll be sharing them with you. And uh, I just, I've, I've been blessed by this, John, in a way that, that um, you know, is very personal. And, um, you know, I've been looking forward to this for a long, long time. I felt like we had to come to some culmination of interviews before <laughs> we got what I call the grand master uh, of uh, near-death experience. <laughs> well, let me tell you, Bert. let me tell you, I want to I wanna say something because we, we, you and I joke about how you can't go there, right? With saying, talking about Jesus and being in his presence, you know, without it bringing you to tears. And I have to say, you know, cause there are, there are multiple people like yourself. I mean, who, you know, like CEOs, commercial airline pilots, doctors. And when you guys talk, about Jesus and your physical human body can't contain the emotion of the feelings of love you still experience. It just helps me so much. You know, it helps me so much because it just helps me go when, when life is hard, it's going to be okay. It's worth it. Persevere. Don't let go of the Lord. He is the one you want. You know, and I think I've known that intellectually, but you guys have convinced me at a heart level of the truth of that, that, you know, all that our heart desires, he's going to fulfill when, when we're in his presence. And so thank you for, uh, for um, you know, not being able to control your emotions. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was the advantage of me interviewing you. So yeah. I didn't have to go there, right? <laughs> if it was if it was the turnaround, you'd be I'd be the Kleenex is over here and I'd be wiping my uh cheeks and all that. Was, but uh, you know, it's it's a beautiful thing. And it's not just you. You know, it's not just you. And and I think that, that you know, you can't you can't fake that. When someone is so crazy in love, you know, with their children and they talk about them it brings them it brings that emotion up right or you know their spouse or but that's that's who god will be to us you know really the 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 love of all loves and i just so appreciate you guys coming forward because i know it's such a sacred experience that 
you can't put words to it and, and anything feels like it belittles it. And so it's challenging to even do what you're doing, but I know also it's what Jesus has called you to do in this day and age, you know, to testify about his reality. So thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you, John, for uh, giving us a voice out there in the, uh, in the proverbial wilderness, you know, like Paul, I never realized until I uh, studied the, the time period of uh, my sharing when Tom Paul's was actually 14 years the same. And I, Before and I realized forward, yeah. why Paul, you know, and I thought I would have never I, I uh, realized, and this may be true or not, why Paul would wait 14 years, you know, to write his account mm. of being in the third heaven. And then I, uh, it's, and I, based on what we had talked about, you know, a number of reasons why, you know, you just, until uh, God released him and said, you know, you're going to do it. I mean, it's not something that comes uh, easily or, you know, it's, it changes your life. Um, You've talked about the crying part and that my most, um, it wasn't embarrassing. I've gotten over the embarrassment part of it. Uh, cause I've, I've been there so many times, but I was at a, a meeting, you know, with a tie on, you know, a jacket and one of those kind of situations for, uh, with business people. And somebody asked me that and said, Hey, I'm really interested. Would you explain your experience? And I was, and I, and I got to the part of meeting Jesus and it was like, Ooh, and can you imagine? I mean, just my, <laughs> my reputation at that point was like, okay. <laughs> Uh, okay, but, but now we'll what, talk about the uh, chart here, and let's go over to the PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> but you what know, I just, love, Randy, is that you can't fake that, you, you know? I mean, you have to be a really good actor to fake that. But it's part of what, you know, I mean, I was convinced that these were real by uh, the corroborative evidence of what people experienced outside their body of what was going on in the resuscitation and just the, even the statistics of how accurate their description of their resuscitation was. But on a personal level, the more I interviewed you guys who had had these, you sit across from someone and you hear it and you're like, this is genuine, you mm-hmm. know? And, and, and there's something genuine about, and, and I will say this as well. There have been some who have been on the road talking about this for so long it's become a little clinical and stale Mm. and 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 not many and not many but the genuineness of it i i think you know don't lose because it's another thing that just helped me go no this is this is real there's nothing i can think of that would convince this many highly successful people to put their careers on the line to talk about something that most people are just going to go like, okay, whatever. Hey, did you hear about? So I appreciate, I appreciate your faith and it is faith, you know, it's it's faith of stepping out and trusting God, no matter what happens, you know, with what people think about you. Yeah. And I think it goes back to what you talked about previously. And that is, you know, heaven being more real, that experience being more real than this world, but that experience translate, translates to living in this world. So, you know, uh, I can't, you know, and you've heard this before, you know, can't recall something maybe two weeks ago, and yet something a number, you know, many years ago um, can, re- can remember vividly. And I know that you've talked about that with other people as well, because yeah, not, I, I mean, they tell me, and I mean, you know better, but they tell me it's not a memory like you have up here that yeah. fades. It's a memory in here. And when I go to that place, I'm there. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's an instant. Uh, I don't know what the word is, transportation or uh, whatever it is that's going on there. I, I tend to feel it's that heaven never leaves you, you know, that it's, Good grief. I'm going to remain in interviewing you, you, John. We're not going to go there, okay? (laughs) I think that is before I start um, getting into into that uh, emotional state. I want to say thank you so, so much 
for being with us today. Uh, look forward to hopefully having you back in the future. Absolutely. Maybe we can have Anytime like a you want to talk. A, uh, yeah. Session. That would but, be great. Yeah. And again, go to randyk.org uh, for the Afterlife 2022 conference. We'll have John speaking keynote, but we'll have other speakers, some of whom I think you've mentioned and many of whom you've written about uh, that will be participating in this as well. And so it's going to be a phenomenal uh, experience where you'll be blessed in Christ and um and so much appreciate you, my friend, and I'm sure our audience uh, will as well. So uh, any last words from you, John, before we close? Well, I, I would just say, you know, seek Jesus above all else because he is your heart's desire. And Randy's seen that face to face, but one day we all will. We will. And that is heaven is in our future. So um, that's a great, great amen to that. So again, thank you, John, and uh, stay tuned. Um, we'll be premiering this as well. Uh, of course, it's premiering at the time you hear me saying that. And um, God bless you. And uh, until next time, um, be blessed. Heaven is in your future. Take care. Bye for you guys. Thanks for listening. Please like and subscribe. And if you'd like further information, go to our website at randyk.org, where our mission is simple, to share the great news of God's love.